OK, so um, thanks very much to you all for coming. I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. This is the Extending Knowledge Impact uh, event workshop. Um, it's, this is a, a very new thing for us. Um, I think this is probably generally true of academics that we have this habit of only talking to each other. And I think it's especially probably true of philosophers. Uh, but what we're trying to do with this event is bring people from lots of different backgrounds, academic and non-academic, and then explain the research project that we've been doing on extended knowledge, and hopefully explain why it's important and has important practical uh, implications. So what we're going to do is we're going to very short talks throughout the day, and they, they will really will be short, 15, 20 minutes, just like this. my talk just now has been about that length. So we want, you won't have people talking at you endlessly. There'll be discussion, we'll plenty of opportunities for discussion. We've got breakout sessions. We've even got some short um, recorded lectures uh, at various junctures from various international people who were involved in the project. And we're going to hopefully give you a sense of what the project's about, its main research results, and what we think are its practical implications. But we also want to hear from you what you think its practical implications are. And in particular, we're hoping that you can give us a fresh perspective on this. So, um, oh, I should say, by the way, I haven't even introduced myself. My, my name's Duncan Pritchard. I'm a professor here. Um, I was um, the, the lead on this project, what we call the PI, the Principal Investigator. I'm also, uh, as it happens, the director of a research center we host, have here called Aiden, uh, which hosted the project. So I've got multiple hats on today. And what I'm going to do is just give you an overview of the project. So first, a, a bit of background. Um, there are two fields of philosophical research that Edinburgh is very much associated with, at least two. One is the philosophy of mind and cognitive science. And this reflects the fact that Edinburgh, generally speaking, is very, it's one of the world's centers for cognitive science. I mean, right now you're in the, this wonderful informatics forum with all these great research has gone, gone on here in Edinburgh for, for a long time. Well, not in this particular building, this is new, but um, uh, the, the informatics or epistemics as it used to be known has been in Edinburgh for a long time. Uh, we've got philosophy and linguistics are in the new building next door neuroscience and psychology over the road. So you're, you're kind of in the sort of cognitive science quarter of, of Edinburgh right now. So cognitive science is very big here, and this is reflected in the philosophy department. I mean, we, the philosophy department is very strong on the philosophy of, of mind and cognitive science. And there's lots of interactions between the two groups. And in particular, one thing that we're very much associated with is the, uh, the idea of ex the extended mind or extended cognition. I'm going to focus on extended cognition, although often it's called extended mind. And there's a good reason for that, which is that uh, the idea originates with, with one of our own. Uh, in fact, it's uh, Andy Clark, who's over there, who's also on the project. Give everyone a wave, Andy. There you go. <laughs> he was uh, one of the originators uh, of this, this idea, along with uh, David Chalmers, another uh, famous philosopher. Now, this idea, extended cognition, has been extremely influential. I mean, it's not just influential within philosophy, it's influential in cognitive science more generally. And the two have sort of fed off each other because it's, it's a thesis which is both philosophical and empirical, has empirical consequences, and can be you know, empirically confirmed and tested. And the idea is that um, we shouldn't think of extended, of, of cognitive processes as purely taking place in the brain. In fact, more generally, purely taking place within the, the skin and skull of the subject. Rather, cognitive processes can extend beyond the skin of the subject and take in features of the environment which are external to the subject. They can be proper parts of the cognitive process. And just to be clear, this claim is not metaphorical. It might be easy to think that this is just a metaphor. It's not. This is meant to be taken literally. We to think of the cognitive process in certain kinds of special conditions as extending beyond the skin of the subject. Now, obvious kinds of examples uh, the easiest kind of cases, I think, to picture this are cases of sort of wearable tech. I mean, I've got some Google glasses there. Um, the thought is that uh, the human, human brain, as it were, the, the, the human cognitive subject is such that we're constantly looking for ways to sort of cognitively offload onto our environment. So whereas we can, some of our cognitive processes are exclusively in the head, you know, we have our biological memories, we can also use external devices to augment those cognitive processes. So we can have like a memory, as it were, which is in the, in, a, in the tech, or perception which involves the wearable tech and so forth. Now this, this idea has been very influential in philosophy, and I say very influential in cognitive science. And the two, are, they feed into one another. 
There's lots of empirical support for this idea in cognitive science. It's informed a lot of thinking in cognitive science. And it's also changed a lot of our philosophical thinking about uh, the nature of the mind, the nature of cognition. One thing I want to just note here, it, although extended cognition is easiest, the easiest way to, to explain this is through uh, high-tech devices, wearable tech and so forth. If the extended cognition thesis is right, then extended cognition probably happens all the while. In fact, it probably doesn't even need high tech to occur. It may be the kind of thing that's been happening for a long time in human evolution. It may be things like language, for example, or examples of extended cognition, of, of uh, outsourcing cognition to things external to ourselves. And indeed, extended cognition needn't always involve technology. It may involve other people. So there's a possibility of a distributed cognition, socially distributed cognition. So socially extended cognition. And this is something else we've been exploring with this project. So one thing that Edinburgh is familiar with, uh, which where we flourish philosophically, is philosophy of mind and cognitive science. And then the other is another field, is epistemology. So epistemology is a core area of philosophy. It's concerned with the nature of knowledge and, and related notions, cognate notions like truth, rationality, understanding, wisdom, and so on. It's a core area of philosophy. And yet, one thing we noticed early on, and which, which gave rise to the project, was that uh, although there's been an awful lot of work on extended cognition, from lots of different perspectives, lots of different disciplinary perspectives, there hadn't really been any discussion at all of the epistemological ramifications of extended cognition. And this is, on face of it, kind of mysterious. Because if there can be extended cognitive processes, well, presumably then there can be extended knowledge, right? I mean, knowledge is the result of cognitive processes. So if, if there are extended cognitive processes, then there, there ought to presumably be extended knowledge. Indeed, not just knowledge, other kinds of epistemic standings too. So extended cognition entails, on the face of it, extended knowledge. So knowledge is the result of extended cognitive processes. And more generally, entails an extended epistemology. So we should think of knowledge as being acquired not exclusively through purely internal means. Now, when I say there was nothing written on this, I, I do literally mean that. I, in fact, I can t quite confidently tell you that the very first paper on this appeared in 2010. And the reason I know it's the first paper that appeared on this is because I wrote it. Now, that's how this, this thing started. And it, it, it's one of these mysteries, I think, these sociological mysteries about uh, academic inquiry that some questions just don't get asked at a certain point. And one of the things we want to do this project is to, is to ask precisely that question. What are the epistemological ramifications of extended cognition? So in that way, we want to bring together the two fields, philosophy of mind and cognitive science and epistemology. We also think there's an important practical element to this as well, in that although, as I say, extended cognition doesn't require higher tech on the face of it to occur, Technological innovations that we've seen and we're increasingly seeing in our, in our lives make extended cognition more and more pervasive. And if that's right, then the implications of extended knowledge and extended epistemology, they're, they're, they're going to become more pervasive. I mean, increasingly our ways of knowing will be more and more extended. And if that's right, then we need to think about what is the nature of those epistemic states. So here's the project. We were very lucky. Um, the Arts and Humanities Research Council gave us uh, a large grant three year to, to, to run the project, three-year project. As I say, it was hosted by the Aden Research Center. So, and then the research team, the, the local teams, had five members. Myself as the PI, the principal investigator. Andy Clark was uh, the, also led the project. And so, so Andy comes from more of a philosophy of mind and cognitive science background. I come from more of an epistemology background. And then we also had Professor Jesper Kallstra, to give him a wave, Jesper, who uh, joined the project too. And we've, the, the way Jesper fits in is that, as I say, I'm more of the epistemologist. So I've had to get my head around a lot of the philosophy of cognitive science. Andy's more of a philosopher of cognitive science. He's been getting his head around the epistemology. Jesper came to the project having a background both in epistemology and philosophy of mind and cognitive science. So it was a, 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 good, a good fit, you know. And then we hired two fantastic postdocs, uh, Dr. Adam Carter and Dr. Estes Permos. So that's Adam there, and this is Arrestis. And you, you'll all be familiar with Arrestis because Arrestis has been the principal organizer of this event, so you'll have various emails and things from uh, the junctures. 
And again, actually, there's a nice blend there. Arrestus has more of a background in philosophy of mind, concrete science. Adam has more of a background in epistemology. So when we're trying to create this new field, we need to bring together people with a, with a range of different uh, backgrounds in order to make, that, make this happen. And then we've hosted a range of research activity, international conferences, workshops, and so forth. We've brought together people from lots of different disciplines. I mean, this isn't even a full list. Informatics, history, psychology, linguistics, law, education, archaeology. So we've tried to get all these scholars together and get them to think about these questions and to help us produce a body of research on this topic. And indeed, we have produced a body of research, you know, an awful lot. This has gone from being an area which was completely neglected to now there's, this, this, uh, there's a whole developed debate now about extended epistemology, what this might be, what its implications might be. We've also tried to um, write articles more for a popular audience as well, to try and popularize some of these ideas, to try and get the ideas out of the academia and get them into the mainstream. And if you go to the project webpage, you'll find uh, there's lots there, lots of information. We've, we've tried to record everything that's happened, so there's lots of films and so on. In fact, uh, there's two other things I meant to say right at the start, actually, and I forgot. One is that we've created a Google Drive. Arrestus has sent you an, uh, an email about this. So what we've done is all of the presentations, everything related to this, the research that we've produced, the key findings anyway, and indeed the, um, the stuff we've written for a popular audience, it's all, it's all going to be in the Google Drive. So you can check it out, and we'll keep it there. So you can check it out today if you wish, but later on, if you, you know, six months from now, you think something, you remember something that interests you, go back to the Google Drive, you almost certainly find it in there. Or, you, or indeed, you can contact us and we can give you it. The other thing we're doing today is um, we're also uh, live tweeting the event. Um, hashtag Aiden Impact. So if, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, you, you can follow us on that. Okay, so the project falls into three phases. The first phase, each phase roughly corresponds to a year of the project. The first phase was about mapping the terrain. Because it's a field, you know, it takes time just to work out what the theoretical options are. To, so we thought this is a sort of topological phase of the project. Mapping out how everything fits together, what are the options? And one of the big things that came out of that phase actually was a, a very long paper that all the five local uh, members of the project authored together um, on extended knowledge, which just it, it explains what an extended knowledge might be and how it and situates it within the field more generally. And then in phase two, we focused on extended epistemology. So focusing now is particularly on uh, cognitive extension involving technology, instrumentation. One of the big findings of this phase was that um, we demonstrated that the, the dominant way of thinking in epistemology, which is known as a virtue epistemology, which you'll hear a lot more about today, that that was, in fact, not only compatible with extended cognition, but, in fact, was amenable to it. So what I mean by that is that um, although many people who propose virtue epistemology take it for granted that cognition isn't extended, there's no inherent reason why they couldn't endorse extended cognition. And moreover, virtuous knowers, in the sense that they talk about it, well, there's every reason to think that they would be extended knowers. So it's, it's more than just a compatibility claim. The claim is that uh, actually, if you're a virtue epistemologist, you, you probably should endorse an extended epistemology. And then we started looking at some of the implications of this, fields like law and education. And then phase three was focused, so it was phase two is about cognitive extension involving instrumentation. In phase three, we were more focused on socially extended cognition, socially distributed cognition. So, you know, if, if, cogn if cognitive processes can be extended outside the, the skin and skull of the subject, then can they be extended to groups of knowers? Can we make sense of group knowledge in that way? Uh, and this, that, was, that was our focus here, and we looked at some of its implications for things, areas like education and informatics. Okay, so that's the general overview of the project. You're going to hear a lot more about the project as the day goes on. Uh, the first, first talk in a moment, appropriately enough, will be by Andy on this. What we want to do today is we want to give you a sense of the project. We also want to explore its practical implications. So we'll be telling you a bit about what we think its practical implications are. But we're hoping you can tell us what you think its practical implications might be. Um, and as I say, um, everything, all these talks, we've got the references um, here. And you've got access to the PowerPoints and the Google Drive. 
the research is also in the Google Drive. So anything you want to follow up, it's all available. And on that note, I'll, I'll end. So thanks very much for coming.